How many marijuana smokers in the U.S.? There's an estimate by the federal government that there are 25 million marijuana smokers in the United States. One out of seven adults use marijuana, and people between the ages of 18 and 24, one out of three. Los Angeles, go ahead. Uh, hello. Uh, am I on? You're on the air. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I, uh, I'm a Bush supporter. I agree with Mr. St. Pierre. Uh, why is the government listing it as a class one drug? It's outrageous. Uh, nobody has ever died from the use of marijuana. I've never taken marijuana myself. I guess maybe I smoked a joint or something when I was a child. Uh, you know, a kid, a teenager took a puff of a, you know, smoke or whatever. But I'm concerned mostly about uh, this, these rights we are, uh, our rights are being taken away uh, slowly. Uh, every moment we turn around, it's like uh, we have to anticipate what new right will be taken away from us. And uh, it's, a, it's like that reefer madness ridiculousness of uh, the 50s, you know? It's crazy. Uh, and I, like if you're on workers' compensation or something, and then they have this SB 899 law, and it also affects the Shibo case in ways that you have no control anymore of what goes on in your own life, and you can't, and nobody's, nobody supports you. And then when you, what entity do you go to to have someone protect you against this, and I respect men like Mr. St. Pierre that have guts. And, uh, All right, caller, let's get a response. Well, thank you. I appreciate your kind words. Um, two aspects. One is scheduling. There's no doubt that one does not need a, a pharmacology degree from a fine university to figure out there must be something wrong with the scheduling of marijuana. What do I speak of? There are five schedules of drugs. For all intent purposes, schedule four and five, any one of us can get at a CVS, Rexall, Walgreens. Schedule two and three are drugs that you have to go to a doctor. You get poked, probed, put into a machine, they scribble something down on a piece of paper, you hand it to a pharmacist, and they hand you, in some cases, OxyContin, um, hospital quality cocaine, etc. That's legal and permissible. However, schedule one drugs, LSD, heroin, and marijuana, for the purposes of our discussion, are Schedule 1. And the three criteria that place it in Schedule 1 is that it has to be highly addictive, something we've already talked about today and, and argue is not true. Two, that it has to have a high potential for abuse. Well, that's ridiculous. Tobacco, alcohol, and hundreds of thousands of pharmaceutical drugs have a high potential for abuse. And lastly, and probably most fraudulently, marijuana has to have zero medical therapeutic quality and that clearly is not the case so at this point it seems that the best thing that can be done to reschedule to to change marijuana laws is simply to reschedule them to bring marijuana at least to a schedule two drug and I do agree that we culturally are caught in an odd period where our government to a large degree is engaged in as you describe reefer madness however the culture is not and I I think a very good example of that will be at Showtime, the cable network will be having uh, a musical premiere, Reefer Madness, in mid-month of April, and I think that will be a very good example of poking fun at the nearly 70-year prohibition on marijuana in the United States. Is marijuana legal in any country? It is not technically legal in any country under a 1961 single convention narcotic treaty. However, uh, you and I, if we were to fly to the Netherlands, we would be able to go into over 350, as they're known, coffee shops in, in Amsterdam proper where we would buy hundreds of different strains of marijuana and hash where we could use it on site or take it back to our private property. And that's the only country where that's you can do that? That's virtually the only country where you can do that. There are certainly other countries where, where marijuana enjoys a de minimis enforcement of law. Countries like Jamaica, Belize, Costa Rica, uh, many throughout Africa and Asia. What about Canada? Canada is moving very quickly towards decriminalizing marijuana and is a very contentious matter between the United States and Canada. While Canada has not officially decriminalized marijuana, you would be hard-pressed not to think so in a city such as Vancouver, where there are now a few commercial blocks where there are coffee shop-like environments where adults can go in and buy and use small amounts of marijuana. However, uh, coast to coast, uh, Canada has not decriminalized marijuana. Sacramento, go ahead, please. Hello. Um, I, too, have a cold, and I'm sorry about that. But uh, my uh, question is twofold. Um, do you have any studies whatsoever that will say that marijuana is not addictive, period? And secondly, do you have an interest or are you affiliated with any of the so-called illegal marijuana growers right now? 
Uh, no, uh, I'm not affiliated with any illegal marijuana growers. I live uh, a few blocks from the White House and live a, a rather K Street existence, if you will. Um, uh, your first question, which was, had to do with... Uh, 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 it's it slipped my mind. We would hate, hate to think that the kind of stereotypes could be come up with between our not being able to remember her first question here. Um, uh, association with uh, illegal marijuana growers and oh, studies. Whether it's about whether addictive. It's addictive. Yes. Again, uh, since 1972, uh, there have been at least eight different major studies looking at whether marijuana causes the same level of physical and psychological addictiveness. Uh, that does say drugs like cocaine, morphine, heroin, and it simply does not have that capability. Cannabis does not create a um, a striving to use cannabis, and if one doesn't use it, they don't become um, they don't go through withdrawals and they don't act illogically. Are and they these don't government try to studies. Yes, all of the studies that look at marijuana for all intents purposes are funded by the taxpayers. Next call for Alan St. Pierre is Fort Lauderdale. Go ahead, you're on the air. Yes, good morning. Uh, I am a six, I will be 66 next month. I have smoked pot since I am 18 years of age. I've raised three children. I've worked smoking pot. Two years ago, I've decided to quit and put it down. No withdrawal, no pain, none of this nonsense of addiction. Personally, I think they should put bigger controls on alcohol because you've never seen someone driving pot kill somebody. But every day, practically, you can read about someone drunk that kills somebody. What kind of work did you do, caller? I'm a professional. I was a hairdresser. All right. And Thank again, there's no uh, habit for me. It's basically habit for me. Once you quit, you quit. You put it down and you change your mind. That's it. You move on with your life. His experience seems to be very similar to many, many older Americans today. And one of the largest aspects, components of changing marijuana laws, which is totally beyond the control of the government, is demographics and the baby boom generation. This gentleman represents, to a large degree, the baby boom generation, whose mores and values developed after 1960. And it is on that break, 1960, if you have developed your mores and values before that, it's not terribly likely you're going to be inclined to support marijuana law reform. So he represents in many degrees uh, the large demographic bubble that's coming to bear in this country of ours.